Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and get to hear all these talks and have an opportunity to talk about our work as well. Um, the story I'll be talking about today begins in 1936. It's a story that will take us to the neuroscience of social intelligence, but before we get there, let's rewind the tape a little bit um, to this man, Dale Carnegie. Now, in 1936, Carnegie wrote this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Carnegie was a traveling salesman who had then become a public speaker, so he had no particular expertise in winning friends and influencing people, other than the fact that he'd actually been immensely successful at doing so. And in this book, which, by the way, since 1936 has now sold 15 million copies and can still be purchased today, so an enormously successful book, in this book, Carnegie gives us advice about how to do exactly that. To win friends, Carnegie, Carnegie suggests that we shouldn't criticize, condemn, or complain that we should encourage others to talk about themselves. In order to influence people, he suggests that we show respect for others' opinions, and that when we're wrong, we should admit it quickly and emphatically. Now, essentially what Carnegie is saying here in this book, and of course he offers more than just these four pieces of advice in his book, but essentially what he's saying is that social knowledge, social IQ, social intelligence, they're all one and the same thing. If you know the rules of social behavior, then you can be socially intelligent, and then you can be socially effective. But if you actually think about the advice that he's giving, there's something a little bit unusual here, something a little bit confusing, and that is that the advice that he's offering is so incredibly obvious. This is the kind of thing that most of us have learned in primary school. So how can you sell 15 million copies telling people something that they already, that they already know? And that's a question that I'd like to explore, but before we do, let's rewind the tape a little bit further, and let's go back to this guy here, Phineas Gage. Now, in mid-September of 1848, Phineas Gage, who was the foreman of a, road, of a railroad crew, was blasting through this rocky outcrop and to lay that exact uh, railroad line that you see right there outside Cavendish, Vermont. And he was using this tamping iron that you see in his hand, and he was tamping the gunpowder down into a piece of rock when he accidentally struck a spark against the rock and causing the gunpowder to explode. That tamping iron in his hand uh, then shot right through his head, um, passed through it right below his cheek and came out the top of his head, landing a full 25 meters further away. Now, this would kill almost anyone, almost every time, but somehow Phineas Gage actually survived this. Uh, you can see that's his actual skull that's held in a museum, and you can see that piece that got knocked out uh, when the tamping iron passed through his head. Nonetheless, a few moments later, he sat up, he walked back over to the horse and cart, and they drove him back to town, where admittedly he took several months to to convalesce. Nonetheless, he survived it, and in so doing, he became the most famous neuroscience patient of all time. And the reason for that is that his personality had forever changed. He went from somebody who was incredibly reliable, who could be counted on, who was planful and thoughtful, to somebody who was impulsive, who was profane, who just did whatever um, the mood, whatever mood occurred to him, he acted upon that mood. So he, he was living in the moment after that. Now, he did improve over time, but there was an enormous shift right at the time of the accident and it lasted for quite a few years. In fact, the shift was so strong that even though the company that had employed him felt a great deal of sympathy for him, they felt terrible about what had happened, they refused to employ him anymore after that. He simply couldn't work in that capacity anymore. He couldn't serve as the foreman of this crew. So, with Gage in mind, we can then ask the question, why is it that we need somebody like Dale Carnegie to tell us things that we already know? Why is it that we need to get this lesson that really all of us pretty much learn in primary school? And what I'd like to suggest is because that lesson is so hard to follow. If you think about what he's saying, we actually fail to do this all the time. We do criticize and complain. We, um, when others talk about themselves, we fail to listen. We can hardly stand it. We, um, we rarely show respect for others' opinions. And when we're wrong, that's one of the most difficult things on earth is to admit it, especially to do so quickly and emphatically. We hate to do that. Now, why is this? I don't think it's because we don't know Carnegie's advice. We know full well what we should do. It's because we can't actually execute that advice. Doing so is incredibly difficult. And it's difficult for the exact reasons um, that uh, Phineas Gage taught us. And that is, the problem with the standard model of social intelligence, which we've had since Carnegie, is that it doesn't take into account how difficult it is to execute these social rules. You know, we all want to do the right thing, but it's not so easy to always do so. So this, um, what I'd like to argue, therefore, is that the model ignores this lesson taught to us by Phineas Gage. 
And what is that lesson? Well, that's the main point of my talk today. And that is that social intelligence is more than just social knowledge. It's not just knowing the rules, it's an actual ability to execute those rules, to do that which we know is the right thing to do. Now this can actually be very difficult, particularly when our emotions are strong. It can be very challenging for us to engage in the right thing. And probably all of you have had the experience where you knew exactly what you should do, and you knew you weren't doing it, even as you weren't doing it. And you might have even known that you were going to regret your behavior later, but you still couldn't stop yourself from doing that which was so dominant in your mind at the moment, from yelling at somebody, from being selfish, from whatever the case might be. Like Phineas Gage, in this case, our frontal lobes are just not up to the task. So what I'd like to do now is talk to you about what we've done in our lab to study what I'll call the Phineas Gage lesson, to study how it is that we can actually use our social intelligence in order to behave properly in a variety of different kinds of everyday social situations. Now, if you think about Phineas Gage, before his accident, he, he pretty much did the right thing most of the time. He was a reliable person who could be counted on. After his accident, he became impulsive. He started to do and say whatever occurred to him. So, we can look at this exact same phenomenon in the lab by simply looking, putting people in challenging circumstances and testing their ability to do the right thing, particularly when the rules are obvious, and see if they can execute those rules. So, we began this line of research by bringing people into the laboratory and telling them that, them that they were doing a study on the effects of food chemicals on memory. Now, that was just a cover story. We weren't interested in food chemicals and we weren't interested in memory. We were really just interested in putting people in a provocative situation and seeing how they responded. So in the key experimental condition, our experimenter was always Chinese and our participants were always white Australians. And what she told them is, oh, you're in luck. You're going to get to eat my favorite food. It's the national dish of China. Now, they don't know what they're about to be fed, but they do know that whatever it is, they should at least pretend to like, right? It's it's personally significant to her, and it's culturally significant to her as well. And then, in close proximity to the participant's face, voila. <laughs> we show them a chicken foot that's cooked in a Chinese style, which we actually cooked up every morning. And so the thing is that white Australians aren't used to seeing this item as food. And so what we can then do is see how do they respond to it. Well, some people actually responded very well. They would look at that and they'd go, oh, it looks lovely, but alas, uh, I don't think it's kosher. I can't eat that. Or I'm a vegetarian. I can't eat that. Or they pop it right in their mouth. Um, other people, though, didn't do such a good job keeping it together. And my favorite quote was from one participant who said, that is bloody revolting. <laughs> and then he looked at her and she looked at him and, you know, sorry, <laughs> you know. He's pretty much put his foot in his mouth and what can he do about it at that point, right? <laughs> sorry. So, so the thing is, this, this certainly shows us that there's big individual differences in our abilities to be socially inappropriate or socially appropriate, but what role do the frontal lobes play? Well, we also gave them a very simple test of frontal lobe functioning. And what we found was that people who did better on that test of frontal lobe functioning were far more likely to say an appropriate response, far less likely to make an inappropriate face, which we could easily pick up on our hidden camera. So having good, well-functioning frontal lobes enabled people to execute a rule that they all knew. They all knew exactly what they should do, but not everybody could do it. Now, we've also looked at the same kind of idea among older adults. As we age, our brain tends to shrink just like our muscles does. And one of the first parts of the brain to shrink are the frontal lobes, which you see up there in purple. Now remember, the frontal lobes are the seat of self-control. And also remember that not everybody ages and not everybody shows this process at the same pace. Some people show a lot of frontal lobe shrinkage as they age, some people less so. It's all part of the normal variation. Now what that suggests, though, is that one of the things that might happen as we age is that we could unintentionally become socially inappropriate. So we looked at this idea in our lab by bringing people in and giving them tests of frontal lobe functioning, and then in one set of experiments, looking at what their friends say about them. And what we find is that those older adults who don't do very well on our tests of frontal lobe functioning also have friends who, for example, say that they tend to ask about private events in public situations. So they might say, hey, Tim, how are your hemorrhoids doing? Now, that could be a great and friendly question if we weren't in an audience of 100, but under the circumstances, it could be a little bit embarrassing if he had a hemorrhoid problem. Now, if we were in private, he might go, oh, Bill, they're killing me. Thanks for asking. But in this circumstance, what people actually find that more humiliating than they find it touching and, and concerning. And so what was interesting was that in our experiments, all the older adults in our sample know full well that that behavior is inappropriate. They know it's the wrong thing to ask. But those who show greater atrophy of the frontal lobes are more likely to engage in this kind of behavior. Now, the... The key here, though, is that really all we've been doing so far is looking at one half of the problem of, to, of how to engage in socially intelligent behavior, and that is stopping yourself from saying something inappropriate. 
But of course, it's not enough to just not say inappropriate things. You have to say the right thing, and you have to do so at the right time. And so also in our laboratory, we've been very interested in how people can find themselves the right pathway so that they know what to say and they know when to say it. And what we thought might be happening here is that there's another frontal lobe ability that might play a critical role in knowing what to say and when. And that is our ability to detect changing contingencies. As we go through the world, the, the rules of, of the social game change all the time. So I could come home from work and kid around with my wife. He, she can usually smile, but today she doesn't. And if, I have, if my frontal lobes work really well, I'll detect that change in contingency. I'll say, gee, usually that joke gets a smile. Today it didn't. Maybe something is different. And so some of us are quite sensitive to these changing contingencies, some less so. We can test this very simply in the laboratory by looking at people's abilities to detect when rules change. So we give them a task where they learn a rule, and then as soon as we can see that they've learned it, we reverse that rule. And we see how long it takes them to learn that reversal. We call this reversal learning, and we know it's a frontal lobe function that exists right in here. And what we're trying to test is whether this too might play a critical role in enabling people to be socially intelligent. So what we did in, this, uh, in our first experiments is we brought couples into the laboratory, people who've been married or dating for years and years, and we asked them in the laboratory to discuss a contentious issue, something that they've been fighting about for a while. And each couple had their own issue. We then set up the video camera and we leave. We then measure how good they are at reversal learning, this task of contingency detection, and what we find is the following. Those couples who are relatively poor at reversal learning, when they're arguing about contentious issues, they look like this. They're screaming in each other's face and it's really unpleasant. It's not a nice conversation. In contrast, those couples who are good at reversal learning, who can detect changing contingencies, even though they're arguing about contentious issues, they look much more like that. They're, they seem calm, they seem friendly, and they're discussing the exact same issues in a way that doesn't insult the other person, that doesn't put them down. And as a consequence, they're actually much happier in the relationship, which is all brought about just by this little tiny bit of the front of the brain that allows us to detect changing contingencies. Now, from this work, we started to reason, well, if being good at detecting changing contingencies allows people to manage the moods of others, maybe it also allows them to manage the impressions that are formed of them. So we conducted an experiment where we wanted to look at this idea. We wanted to see if people who are good at reversal learning could avoid suspicion, being the, the target of suspicion. So we ran an experiment where people came into the laboratory and they had a group discussion. It was groups of friends. They all knew each other well. And they had a group discussion with the goal of coming up with a solution to a rather complex problem. And they were told that they'll be paid if they can come up with the right solution. But secretly, we took one group member aside and we told them, look, your job is to sabotage your friends. Here's the wrong answer, and we want you to try to talk the group into doing that. And if you can talk them into losing their money, we'll pay you. Now, they actually really resonated to this idea. That sounded like fun to them. And so they did their best to sabotage the group. But the key is, we warned them in advance. We will reveal at the end of this discussion that there was a saboteur. And if you're discovered to be the saboteur, we won't pay you. So your job is to undermine them, but to do so in a way that's sufficiently subtle so that you get away with it at the end. So then what they do, they have the group discussion, and then they go through a series of interrogations where the group interrogates every group member, and we measure how good they are at reversal learning. And what we find is the better they are at reversal learning, the more capable they are as coming across as innocent, the less likely their group is to think that they're the saboteur, that they're the one that they should be suspicious of. Now, we did one other thing in this experiment that allowed us, in some ways, the clearest test of this hypothesis that, um, that knowledge isn't enough, that you must also have the capacity to act on that knowledge. And what that last test was, was we had, remember, they're groups of friends, and so we'd also asked them to report on everyone else in the group with regard to their social skills. We said, you know, how socially skilled is this person, is this person, and we had a brief scale that they filled out about everybody else. So what this allows us is sort of a summary judgment of the social skill of every member of the group. And what we could then do is to divide them into people who are good at reversal learning and people who are not so good at reversal learning. And we could look at the relationship between their actual IQ, which we measured in our experiment, and their um, social functioning, how their peer reports about how socially skilled they are. And what we find when we do that is that people are good at reversal learning. If they're not too bright, which I've indicated by this small brain, they use this strategy that my son is using on this day to try to endear himself to my daughter of whacking her over the head, a socially relatively unskilled strategy. In contrast, for the, um, as they got smarter when they're good at reversal learning, they develop better social 
they develop better strategies for convincing, and here you see the high IQ version, he's convincing his sister to share her ice cream cone with him. So in the same exact sense in the laboratory, as if they're good reversal learners, as they got smarter, their friends said that they were more socially skilled. In contrast, if they were not good reversal learners, amongst those who are poor at this task, well, when they weren't too bright, they were mildly annoying. But interestingly, as they got smarter, they got more annoying. And you can think of this as something like the Sheldon Cooper effect from the Big Bang, where he uses his massive brain primarily to belittle and frustrate his friends. So it seems to be the case that being smart is not enough. We also have to have the capacity to use that intelligence in a socially effective way. Now, in sum, what I've tried to do today is to try to convince you that social knowledge is not enough, that being socially intelligent is more than that. It also involves a variety of capacities, capacities that are seated primarily in the frontal lobes of our brain, and those capacities are what enable us to endear ourselves to others, to charm ourselves into other people's hearts, rather than to continually put our foot in, your, in our mouth. So and I'd like to thank my collaborators in this project, and I'd also like to thank you for your attention at the end of this long day.